This month, New York City enacted rules allowing transgender people to use the bathroom of their choice in city facilities. Similar laws are being debated around the country as the transgender movement pushes for greater protection. And while the transgender community is finding a growing voice in popular culture, its members are still widely misunderstood. A new book, Raising Ryland, chronicles one family's journey parenting a transgender child who's already facing a major hurdle. John Blackstone shows us how the family hopes its story will raise awareness. Not long after her first birthday, Ryland Whittington's parents, Jeff and Hillary, learned their child was profoundly deaf. It wasn't until doctors put in cochlear implants that Ryland was able to hear for the first time. You hear that? For a while there, we didn't know Ryland would be able to talk or hear or just communicate. Ryland did learn to speak, but what she had to say didn't make sense to her family. This is my sister, Bimmy, and I know brother, Ryland. Ryland started saying, I'm a boy. And at the time, we just thought it was cute. It was a phase. I thought maybe I would have a, a tomboy. It was around three that we started to hear it, but around four years old was when it got very strong. Jeff and Hillary struggled to understand, Jeff especially. You were trying to avoid it? I was avoiding for a while. I knew that Ryland was going to have a difficult life with the cochlear implants, or at least that's what my perception was. So to add something on top of that, I just couldn't, I couldn't accept it. I couldn't picture it. I'm sure what a lot of people can't believe about your story is that at three years old, a little girl can say, I'm a little boy. We could have ignored it, and we could have pushed it away, and and said, no, you're a girl, and, and fought it. Well, we did. And we did. <laughs> For the first but, part. But... It, but it became so persistent. They say Ryland demonstrated the key markers that doctors and psychologists look for in determining if a child is transgender. At the time, like so many people, Jeff and Hillary didn't get what it meant to be transgender. Now they do. Watch the ball. This is eight-year-old Ryland today. Over the fence. After much research, counseling, and soul searching, Jeff and Hillary say they came to the inescapable conclusion that Ryland's gender identity did not match the sex on her birth certificate. So at age five, Ryland began living as a boy. When you, when you see pictures of yourself when you were three and four years old, does that seem strange now? Kind of. A little weird. Seems a little weird? Yeah. Ryland remembers how he refused to wear clothes made for girls. It was a little way of showing my mom and dad that I was a boy. What makes you so strong, so determined? I just had a weird feeling that I wanted to be a boy. From the time you were very young? Yeah. This is just as likely to be hardwired as sexual orientation. It's not a choice. Dr. Steven Rosenthal is researching the long-term outcomes of medical treatment for transgender youth in a study funded by the National Institutes of Health. There is no reason to believe that transgender people haven't been around since people have been around, just like uh, any other variation in, in human biology. Rosenthal says treatment is crucial because an alarming 41% of transgender people attempt suicide. But new research in the journal Pediatrics found that children who have socially transitioned to the gender with which they identify had normal levels of depression and anxiety. We have seen so many kids who have come into our practice, like Ryland, um, who have fully socially transitioned. And family after family tells us that as soon as they enable their kid to do this, everything turned around. When you were researching and seeing that attempted suicide rate, 41 percent, what was that? Awful. It was horrible. Awful. You know, would we rather have a living son or a dead daughter? And, you know, we weren't willing to play with that statistic. We'd rather have a living son. What are you guys doing? We're making a cake. I'm not kidding when I say that the child changed overnight. Mm -hmm. It was just, he was so proud all of a sudden and just so happy and just felt so comfortable. And you could just see him ease up. There's people who blame you, say you did this to him. It would never be something that I would push on my child. In certain ways, it, it is and, and, and will make Ryland's life a little bit harder. And I don't want my child's life to be any harder. There are decisions ahead, including whether to eventually give Ryland male hormones. It's a little while before puberty sets in now, but you've got to be thinking about that. You know, thankfully, there's puberty blockers, which 
allow us to delay the onset of puberty for a period of time. I think it is really important to note that, that we haven't done anything that isn't reversible. Jeff and Hillary are awesome. sharing their story because they want Ryland to live in a world we'll we'll that accepts later. him. Hey, Dad, Dad. What? Know how you made that tunnel? Hopefully we just plant the seed of little conversations all over the world. People can just start understanding this more. And there's so many more people who are willing to go public with it and who are coming out and trying to help this world to understand. So I think I mean, we'll get there. We'll get there. For CBS This Morning, John Blackstone, San Diego. They seem like a very nice family. They don't deserve blame. They deserve applause. Jeff and Hillary, just the fact that we're having the conversation mm -hmm. is so important. I agree. What do you think, Charlie? I think it's very important, and I think people need to know they're not alone. Me too. Me too. Bravo, bravo to that family.